we talked about how uh, the first, we could say it was the first section of the book, which was God's judgment against Israel, or if you prefer, Judah, or even more specifically, Jerusalem. Um, but even within that, you could break it up into two parts. So remember, chapters 1 through 11 was like the judgment against Jerusalem in particular, and then 12 through 24 was the judgment more broadly speaking, it, was, it had a lot of political dimensions and ethical and moral dimensions, and not so much, not as much explicitly religious, although it was there. Mm -hmm. It's true. Not audience per se, but who God is. Yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute, so you're getting ahead of me. So, there, because there is a form, and um, there's a form of prophetic judgment. There's a, there's a way that God goes about this, and he does it like within a chapter. Or, in this, or he'll do it within a, a little a saying, or he'll do it even more broadly in a whole section of a book, or even more broadly, he's doing it in the book of Ezekiel. He's following the same form internally within chapters, but then extra, within groups of chapters, and then within the whole book. It's the same pattern. It just keeps, as Ethan said, expanding out. All right. And of course, Jesus reverses that. When he, uh, when he would say, some, or when... Uh, uh, yeah, when Paul would say, uh, you know, that the gospel goes first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, right? Think Jesus said, go to all nations, first Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, right? So there's the, there's the gospel in ver reversion, if you like, actually bringing all nations back into one rather than scattering them out. Uh, so we're going to look at this chapter, which has judgments against four nations, Amen, Moab, what was the third one? Amen, Moab, uh, Edom. Edom, correct? And then the, we throw in the Philistines for good measure. Because who doesn't? you got to say something against the Philistines. They were there first. They were there first, that's right. They just kind of get thrown in for whatever reason. Um, but before we do that, like I said, this is going to begin a whole section that will end in chapter 33, I think. So it's 25 to 33 is like the third part of this prophetic, and it's now the judgment against all nations. So I gave you a bunch of introduction, and this will set the tone for the rest of the summer, probably. Uh, the type, this type of revelation, there's an oracle against nations, is comparable to Isaiah chapters 13 to 23 in Amos 1 and 2, along with Nahum, the whole book, half of Obadiah, the first half. It's probably about 15 to 20% of the Old Testament, a judgment against Gentiles other nations, all right? Which, by the way, that means you, <laughs> right? Who are not Jews by birth, but have faith in Abraham, by the faith of Abraham. Uh, and the reason for that is, well, before they get that, they are not critiques of nationality of the false prophets, all right? But proclamations of salvation for God's people through eliminating their political and religious enemies. We heard this uh, on a podcast on the way in, Ethan and I did, is that um, Israel fights against God's enemies. God does not fight against Israel's enemies. All right. So it's not like Israel gets to say, hey, we hate the Edomites, and then God, you help us out, and then God comes along and kills them. No, it's the other way around. God says, I bring judgment against the Edomites, you go and do it. All right. So, and, and that's important because, well, I mean, you could talk about this in any kind of context, but with warfare, we could talk about this. Do we have, do we have a mandate from heaven, to quote the Chinese, right? Or what did we call it? Manifest destiny, right? That we had this manifest destiny from God that we were to conquer all of North America or something. Wasn't that what it was? Because we ended up running out everybody, either natives and buying off land from Mexican and, Yeah. Because from sea to shining sea, as we sang, right? Which we're saying, that's, this is all, God promised this all to us somehow, somewhere. All right. Right. But the problem was, did we have a word from God? To say, you, America, are going to be from Pacific to, no. And then, then, of course, it begs the question, well, why is it not manifest destiny to take over Canada? I mean, it would take probably no effort. They'd probably just say, yeah, have us, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. now. Yeah, now. Anyway. All right, so that, that's an important point. It's 
It's God's judgment against Israel's enemy, or against his enemies, but he does it by way of Israel, or by others, actually. All right? The Gentile nations, why do we talk about the Gentiles all the time? Because they are types, like typological, metaphor, if you like, maybe, of the, all the kingdoms of this world. So by studying the nations of the Bible, you actually learn about the character of this world. You meet all types. And they're pretty much all the same in some ways, right? All right, here's the classic prophetic outline that I just mentioned. Ready, Ethan? First part, judgment against Israel. Second part, judgment against the heathen nations. Third part, salvation for Israel and for all. Right? And there I actually give you the quote from Paul, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile, and also from 1 Peter 4. All right? So this is that we're now going to be in the second part, the judgment against the heathen nations. And notice... The judgment against the nations is because they are rebels against God's word. The same judgment God brought against Israel, I should say the same reason God judged Israel is the reason he judges the heathen nations. They do not fear, love, and trust in him. They don't listen to his word. In other words, they don't do what he says. All right. Um, And then these oracles are fitting between 24, which we looked at two weeks ago, or last week, last week, the impending fall of Jerusalem, prophetically spoken, and then the report of the actual fall, which will come in chapter 33. So we're going to be in kind of a, a limbo, in a way. Um, seven nations are addressed. Seven date notices appear in these chapters. There are seven discrete oracles against Egypt, chapters 29 to 32. God's judgment will be universal, much like the seven nations were, that were conquered in Cana in Deuteronomy 7. Right, seven, 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 seven. Seven is seven churches. perfection, right? Completion or the complete number, just like the week, right? That's where that begins. On the seventh day, he rested, right? Um, notably absent between now and chapter 33 is an oracle against Babylon, which just seem curious to you, right? Why no Babylon? Why do we mention everybody else? Egypt, Edom, A- Ammon. Uh, Philistines, right? Assyria. We're, we're not going to talk Babylon about Babylon? Is God still this is correct. Babylon's actually the one God's going to use to destroy all those nations. So he's his agent of wrath against them. Because Israel, uh, Judah taken into, is going to be taken into captivity to Babylon. Babylon's the one who, who takes care of all of them, one way or another. All right. Uh-oh. Which is interesting, right? God has Babylon go through and conquer all these people and devastate them. And then he, God conquers Babylon too. It's like, well, okay. I guess they're not the chosen nation, favored nation status, right? Yeah, no. Um, but you, if you want an oracle against Babylon, Isaiah 13, 14, or Revelation 17 to 19. Babylon is like, Babylon is really the tip, typical like enemy of God as far as the nation goes, especially in Revelation. Yeah, so as Don said, Babylon is the instrument of God's judgment in these chapters. Uh, Note also that the formula or content of the judgment against the heathens mirror that of Israel and Judah, as I said a few minutes ago. They're judged for the same reason, all right? Everyone on the last day will be judged on the same reason. Do you believe on Jesus Christ, confess his name, no, trust in his salvation, that's it, that's it. Everybody's judged on the same basis, all right? Judgment comes against the godless or false worshiping nations that persecute believers, but judgment comes against nations who claim Christian faith and support the church, but suppress or restrict the preaching of the gospel. So you'll even see that in some of these oracles. They let the, they let the faithful people be there, but they prohibit what they can say. All right? So, by the way, God will judge our nation if they restrict our ability to preach the gospel, because that's prohibited by God's word. Right? They can't, they can't restrict the preaching of the gospel. By the way, that's what uh, freedom of religion was supposed to be about. It's coupled to the First Amendment and to, in all of its forms, right? The right to assemble, the right to speak, are in support of the gospel as well. Whether the founders knew that or not isn't the point. That's what it's for. All right. Uh, let's see. And also societies that exert constant pressure on the church to circumscribe, that means to go around, or contradict the scriptures outright. All, so we're going to have all sorts, right? We're going to have false worshiping, godless nations. Well, there's no godless nation. There's no such thing. Even an atheistic nation, well, that's their god, as if there is no god. Think Soviet Russia or something, right? Um, 
or nations that ostensibly allow you to practice your faith, but like we saw, like you see in Daniel, right, with Nebuchadnezzar, it's like, oh yeah, you can be, you can be a Jew, it's fine, you can worship Daniel and your three men, and until you can't, until you're supposed to, at least only for a month, fall down and worship the statue, right? It's only for a month, you know, it's Nebuchadnezzar Pride Month or something. <laughs> uh, oops. All right. All these oracles call for self-examination, repentance, and faith in the promise of freedom from sin that so easily entangles us, Hebrews 12, and all persecution by the enemies of Christ. All right. So, I mean, I think we, even though you're like, we're talking about these people who we don't know and we don't care about, they don't involve us. We don't even know any of these people anymore. A lot of these nations are gone. Um, so what does that matter to us? We put our same fear, love, and trust in nationality or state or civil rulers, if you like, whatever you want to call them, it's fine, right? You know, well, we are children of Sherman Center, so surely God will preserve us, right? That's, <laughs> that, that kind of pride goes before the fall as well. This is how you eat a Long John. <laughs> well done. If, yeah, you need, you need cream filling in it, then he would have ate the whole thing. All right, and then a few more notes before we start. <laughs> uh, just, just to kind of get your, get, you, get your mind going here a little bit. Um, we must affirm the biblical teaching, that is in Romans 13, 1 to 7 and elsewhere, that government authority is established by God to punish wrongdoing. We just talked about that with Babylon, right? Protected citizens and maintain order and peace so that the church can carry out its mission to proclaim the gospel. Okay. So that's the separation of powers doctrine, not church doctrine, but state doctrine, right? Is keep the state out of the business of the church. We won't want the state involved in the business of the church. We don't want them telling us what to say or what we can say or what we can't say or when we can meet or anything, right? And we'll stay out of your business too. Like we're not gonna tell you who can tax and how much, even though I'll tell you that you're stealing. Yeah. I can have that strong opinion, yes. You are thieving. I, I want to preserve my nation's possessions and income, as we learned in the Catechism with the Seventh Commandment, right? And my government does not want my neighbor to have his possessions and income preserved. So I'm, I'm going to speak against that. But um, I don't, that doesn't give me cause to overthrow them, I don't think. Uh, tea party, whatever. All right, so, yeah. But in particular, we're talking about the gospel. It needs to be... That is forgiveness of sins in Christ Jesus. As soon as they say you can't do that, now we're in trouble. Well, look what they did in Canada during COVID. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, they for so, they, not only did they say you can't gather together in person, but in particular, that was not the preaching of the gospel necessarily, although it was. But it was first the proclamation of the law, so the accusation of sin, because the gospel is the forgiveness of sin. How are you going to forgive people unless they know what their sin is? So, like, for example, if you want to forgive somebody who's had a sex change surgery, for example, which I think we probably have to kind of think about now, figure out how are we going to deal with, they show up and clearly they've been on some kind of drugs, right? And had some kind of surgeries, maybe. All right. and they, but they want forgiveness. They know they've done, that, or they inherently or intrinsically know that they've made a mess of things, right? We say, well, of course we'd forgive them. Yeah, but it's going to be uncomfortable, right? Um... But if they come and they don't think that they've done wrong, and we're going to say to them, yeah, we know what the state permits, but we don't. I'm like, what? Don't you have to permit everything the state permits? No. No? And you want some lists? Oh, I got a list of them here. Hold on. We're going to get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. The church may well wish to advertise its patriotism toward a benign government, if there is such a thing. Still, one may question whether it should go so far as to hold a special service specifically to celebrate a national holiday. I hear it every year. Why are we singing patriotic hymns? There are no patriotic hymns. Um, display the nation's flag in the chancel, which we don't do. It's in the, nar or in the nave. If it were in the chancel, I would have gotten in trouble many times over already trying to get it out of there because it doesn't belong by the altar. Right? Any more than the pride flag belongs between two American flags. That was White House yesterday, which is a violation of the flag code. Did they have not anybody know like the flag law, the flag code? Like you violated the, I know the flag code because we had a question like, where do we have to put the American flags if we're going to have one? And can we put a Christian flag higher than it? And you can't, not legally. Mm. 
Right, that's what the code says. Now they had a pride flag up at the same level. Yeah, yeah you look for the pictures online. It's, it's abominable, which that's actually the right word. Um, let's see, at the same time, all right, so we're not gonna be all super patriotic. You know, we can thank God for our country. We do that every year, multiple times. And those who serve our country, we do that as well, right? Yep. And we can even say our country is a gift from God, as flawed and fallible as it is, right? Because it could be worse, <laughs> I suppose. Um, at the same time, we must protect, protest the view of the state evident in the radical left wing of the visible, visible Christendom. We call these the mainline churches, where America and the capitalist West are instinctively condemned as purely evil agents of greed and exploitation. We need to be collectivists and not capitalists. Da, da, da. You've heard this stuff, right? Oh, churches that, Marxism? yeah, no. churches that preach you know, this neo-Marxism or Maoism or whatever, you know, like everybody's accepted here and we're all the proletariat and we have to <laughs> rise up against the, the bourgeois have to rise up against the, I mean, they even use the language of, of Marx. It's like, what are you doing in church? Yeah. So in the church, Ethan's pointing this out. You'll have to do your own reading on this or go find a band books podcast where we've talked about it. I don't know when we did. Um, liberation theology. Have you heard of this? All right. It came out of um, South America and it was connected also to um, the, the uh, edu Marxist education movements that also came out of South America. So these were South Americans that bit off on it. This was, um, you'll see this in, in a lot of African ch American churches because they, they've imported this now from South America where the goal of the church is equity, liberation from oppressive regimes, right? So they will actually, um, who would be a famous example of this? Who was it, Je Jesse, what's his name? This guy was always on TV, who was supposedly a pastor. Jesse, I was gonna say Jesse James, but that's a different guy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, actually, Martin Luther King Jr. is a good example where it was, it was a little bit benign. But remember, he was accused of being a communist. Right. And that's because his theology was. <laughs> okay. As good as, as good as, or as much of a blessing as he worked uh, in our country, or helped contribute to our country, um, his goal was, a, anyway, it doesn't matter. So that, it has infected the church that way. Ethan said prosperity gospel is another, it's another form of that, Right. Um, and it's, these are the people who also say, I mean, we could have like a community chest here at the congregation. That'd be a great idea, right? If you have a surplus, just come and donate it. In the summer, like bring your fruits and vegetables or whatever, right? And then just, if any, and then people take what you want and da da da. And we share with those in need especially, right? Be attentive to that, right? But not under obligation, not under force. Don still wants to do it, but I keep telling him no, he can't, which is, which is that we, we request your tax return and then we tell you what your percentage is that you owe the church every year. Everything would be taken care of. We'd have no problems, we'd have a surplus of money and we could take care of the poor. And nobody would ever be a member of this church because, because we'd be commies. All right, or collectivists if you prefer. All right, so it's in the church. There are churches that do that, I'm not making that up. That Christian churches, supposedly. Mm -hmm, they do. Yep, they want your 1099 or whatever it is. 1040? 1040. All right. Uh, Jesse Jackson. Jesse Jackson, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, because why, as a pastor, what, what business does he have going on pre preaching social change? He doesn't preach forgiveness in Jesus Christ, so he's not a Christian preacher anymore at that point. What is he doing? He's preaching a different gospel. Yeah. He's stirring the pot. Well, that's what he's doing too. <laughs> right, which, um, if you're into such things, if you want just a basic introduction to this kind of cultural revolution stuff that happens in the church too, because there's a brief mention of it, is the Plandemic 3 movie. I don't know if you saw it yet. It's free download. You can watch it for free online. Plandemic 3, it talks about, it talks about um, the social revolution. The first, two part, first part had to do with COVID. Or no, the first part, I think, the first movie had to do more economic. The second part was more COVID, and then... Because COVID was just a, well, it wasn't just, but it was, it was used um, as a Trojan horse for all sorts of cultural and societal change. We all know this. All right. Uh, of course, civil author if civil authorities require people to do or say something sinful or contrary to scripture, the Christian must refuse to comply. Um, I've encouraged you before, and I always forget to do this, but if 
you know, you find out that the state, for example, the state of Wisconsin is funding something that's contrary to our faith, then you send an email or you call up the governor's office, you call up a state, state representative and you say, I don't comply. I don't want, I don't, tax dollars that I contribute to the state cannot contribute to this. We had a law for this with abortion federally. Remember the Hyde Amendment? No tax dollar, well, they found ways around it, but in theory, right, and that's where that came from. Christian said, I can't comply. Same thing with the uh, Obamacare ma mandates, right? No contraceptive and abortive, abortive patient, you know, um, can be used, supposedly. Eh. I'm sure Planned Parenthood gets all their money anyway. All right, so good so far? Now, what are the sort of things? I don't remember, I said I was gonna get to that, and then I, well, here they are, whatever it was, was leading to this. For example, all right, so when do you refuse to comply? Oh, as a church, right. Biblical teachings that are currently under attack in the West include the inspiration and authority of the scripture. Right? So there are people who say that we should listen to other people in church, non-Christians, non, well, people who don't teach according to God's word. Right? So the Buddha or the, or the uh, you know, Dalai Lama? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, the, uh, let me tell you about the Dalai Lama. Um, the salvation... That salvation is through faith in Christ alone. There is salvation in no other. Good luck with your friends and neighbors on that one. Yeah. Uh, since Jesus is the only way to, to God the Father. That only, here's one that'll get you in trouble. That only qualified men are to be ordained into the pastoral office. Uh -huh. We have a clear prohibition in God's word, and yet somehow, I've read, I've read all the comments. I have the books. Um, and they, they'll do anything you can to just say, we just don't agree with what God's word says without actually just coming out and saying that. It's the patriarchal society. Thank you, Ethan. All right. Uh, let's see. That abortion, infanticide, and euthanasia constitute murder. Right? And we don't care about the legality from the state. This was Israel's problem. When the king permitted things, then they said, okay, fine. We'll do it too. Jesus dealt with this. We heard this in our daily prayer with, with divorce, right? Well, Moses gave a certificate of divorce, and Jesus is like, I don't care. Moses did it because you're an idiot. Yeah, hardness of heart, sorry, same idea, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see, where were we? Oh, speaking of, sanctity of marriage as a lifelong and exclusive union, 50 years, another 50 years across the street later, right? 64, right? Almost, yeah. I think, what are we, what are we 26, I think? It's going to be 20. No, 25. It's not 20. 25. We were married in what year? 1998, two years before I was born. What year is it? This, year. this is our, it's not our 25th. This is our 26th. Oh, <laughs> Remind me to. This is the, like the first year we're not going to be on vacation. So we maybe actually can. Maybe can do something silver. Precious yeah. I, can it be in a? I don't know if I want to have it on a house. I got a safe, but I figure people can just pick up the safe. I've never understood that. What's the date? Officially? Yeah. Well, I was gonna look it up. <laughs> June twenty-seventh. June twenty-seventh, nineteen ninety-eight. That is twenty-five then. Oh, I thought it was last year. All right. Good. I sent my parents to the Caribbean for their 25th, and we paid the way. I paid the way. Did a fundraiser. You got a month. Less than a month. My, 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 parent, my parents were in the Peace Corps. Um, and then because of my conception, they had to come home because uh, they didn't want to give birth down there. My mom didn't want to give birth down there. Yeah. Yeah, and then, uh, so they didn't quite get to do their full, so we sent them back down there. A bunch of friends helped us, you know, their like college friends. So you can remind yourself. All right, where were we? <laughs> oh, yes. yes. Uh, homosexuality is intrinsically sinful. Um, we could add a lot more to that now. By the way, why aren't the bisexuals upset with LGBTQ plus IA? B means bisexual, binary. Why are the bisexuals not upset with everybody else being included? Because they're the binary one. I don't, don't. 
The whole thing is not logical. Oh, but it's non-binary. Yeah, right, whatever. We get the non-binaries with the binaries. That sounds like a solidarity group, doesn't it? In the future, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, different biblical teachings will be the focus of society's assaults, just as other ones have been in the past. All right? And it comes and goes. Things come and go. You can go read about uh, the teens into the 30s and what our country was like then. None of you remember that, right? No. Okay. Yeah, there was, there was a huge pullback with the war back to like, we, I mean, we had to, inf we, I mean, frankly, just to, how many young men died, right, with World War II? World War I, actually, even. But by World War II, it's like, uh, we have to do all sorts of things to promote what they called the nuclear family, right? Otherwise, you're talking about extinction level, you know, demographic cliff. Uh-huh, yeah. Yeah, and it, you can't just import people from other places. You can for a while, but it won't work. All right, so there you go. That's a little background. We're going to get all these people. So first, the Ammonites. You've heard of Ammon, right? Okay, we'll give some background, but first let's read it. The word of the Lord. You don't have to read it. Somebody else can read the first one. Yeah, yeah, you will know that I am the Lord. We've talked about this. Every, every knee will bow, every name will confess Jesus is Lord on the last day. But some of them in joy of salvation, right? And others in fear, right? And trembling, right? So ultimately everybody will know eventually. Ammon, Ammon. Let's see, we have some stuff about Ammon. Special attention paid to Ammon, all right? So you, and they even got a double, a double prophecy, right? Yeah, two words. Uh, because of the long history of conflict between it and Israel. Even though historically the Ammonites, like the Moabites, are, were related to the Israelites via descent from Lot. All right, so Abraham and Lot, and then Lot's children. Right? So uh, Israel has always known that, that these are their relatives. Unlike the Philistines, by the way. Philistines are, were immigrated from Phoenicia. They came across the Mediterranean and land. That's why they all live along the sea, because they're sailors, fishermen. Yeah, because there's a scandal in that line. Because in whose line? Ammon? Ammon oh, yeah. Tell us is, about Ammon. Because Ammon is both Lot's son and grandson, because they're really obsessed. Yep. And there was nobody for his daughters to have Right. So, yeah. So it's a kind of a uh, soap opera a little bit, what I say? Uh, their territory is poorly defined. It keeps changing. So, but they tend to, their capital tends to be, um, it's, even today it is called Ammon, actually, the city of Ammon. It's in modern-day Jordan. Modern-day Jordan. All right. First mentioned in Deuteronomy 2, um, Joshua 13 states that half the land of the Ammonites was allotted to the tribe of Gad. I don't know, the tribe of God. The tribe of Gad. All right, during the conquest. David later annexed the whole country, 2 Samuel 10 through 12. At some point, they regained their independence but paid tribute to Judah. It's under King Uzziah and Jotham. And I've just given you all this background. Amos 1, Zephaniah 2 denounce the warfare of the Ammonites. More detail is given in Jeremiah 40, I think it's verse 11. If I remember right, of Ammon's collaboration and then conflict with Babylon. We've talked about this before, how Ammon conspires with Babylon against Judah, and then they flip and they conspire with Egypt. 
It's like if you're going to flip sides, now you've got enemies on both sides, right? Yeah, eventually. So then. But the problem here is uh, when you read about this judgment against Ammon, you might think, well, it's because you know, they were bad political enemies, right? That they, they were enemies of Israel politically, or Judah, I should say. And that's not the judgment, is it? It's, aha, against my sanctuary when it was profaned, right? So how they were rejoicing at the destruction of the temple, or will rejoice at the destruction of the temple. It's coming, right? The desecration of the land. You did nothing when my people were being taken away, right? So no love of neighbor, right? And this is extended family in a way that we're all probably extended family, (laughs) actually, at this point, right? Yeah. Like the, the descendants of Abraham through uh, um, well, Isaac and right. Oh. right. So the, the problem is actually their judgment is, is theological that, um, that they actually didn't protect Judah from going into captivity and they actually rejoiced in that second one. They were clapping their hands, stamping their feet, joy in their heart because of disdain against the people of Israel. Sounds like, sounds like sports fans when their least favorite team loses. Okay. Um, but the judgment is because the, the temple is the place of God's salvation. It's where he distributed salvation for all people, even for Ammonites, right, if they were brought in. So, um, so actually by doing nothing to protect God's means of salvation, that's why they're judged, Right. So again, our nation will be judged, will be judged if it prohibits the preaching of the gospel. Maybe it's being judged for prohibiting the gospel preaching during uh, COVID. Hmm, maybe. All right. All right. So that's what's going on here. Uh, by the way, uh, what they say actually happened, what God promises will happen, that they'll cut off and everything. Nebuchadnezzar takes their title, or God takes their title in land, but he does it through Nebuchadnezzar during that conquest in 582. So Ammon is invaded and depopulated, just like Judah. Judah takes a couple more years, actually, two more years. But, but yeah, Ammon will be, and then they don't, ever, they don't ever exactly come back, just maybe the city of Ammon, right? Uh, Judas Maccabeus reportedly waged war against them, and you can read this in 1 Maccabees 5, and that's uh, 500 years later. So there's people that, that hold on that call themselves Ammonites. It's kind of like saying, I don't know, we have people that like still do like Confederate soldier reenactment. Don't you have a, what is it? Women of the, of the revolution or something? Who are the daughters of the American revolution? And you actually have to like trace your lineage and everything to it. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. You, you can't just join. You can't join. You actually have to, you have to demonstrate that you have, you have lineage that fought in the revolution. I don't know what the group's for. Anybody know? Do they do anything? I don't know. Right. So there's a way. Yeah, the scholarships. There's a way that these things kind of hold on. People call themselves. I'm trying to think of another example of that. I mean, you all consider your, probably yourself, I don't know, Scandinavian, German, what? Yeah. You're, there's nothing remotely German. Can you even speak German? Hello? Yeah, I'm German. Okay. All right, but like in my case, or in your case, you can say, well, you're mostly German, but there's also Scotch Irish in there. So, and the streets of the paternal line are actually more Scotch Irish, right? Maybe. There's German in that line as well. You could trace it paternally, but if you do it. If you add maternally, you're like three quarters, yeah. some kind of Germanic origin. So, yes. whatever, it doesn't matter, right? But if you want, you we could say, oh, I know who it is. Uh, we could say we're the Aryan race again, and just like reinvent it, out, you know, yeah, where it's ideological and less genetic, right, <laughs> or national. Okay. So the Ammonites show up again. Uh, actually, uh, Josephus talks about them as well, but I can give you that citation. Right. But they are wiped out, and there's some people that call themselves Ammonites. But what, what Ezekiel says here, and you also hear in Isaiah, done. God wiped them out, and they're gone. Those people don't exist anymore. And again, it's because of the way they rejected the temple and God's people. 
who are their neighbors, right? So love of neighbor, they had none. They actually clapped and rejoiced when their neighbors were conquered. So they got conquered and plundered. Okay. How about Moab? We know something about Moab. Yeah. Thus says the Lord God, because Moab and Seir said, Behold, the house of Judah is like all the other nations. Therefore, I will lay open the flank of Moab from, the cities, from its cities on its frontier, the glory of the country, Beit Yishimot, Baal Meon, and Kiriataim. I will give it, along with the Ammonites, to the people of the east, as a possession, that the Ammonites may be remembered no more among the nations. And I will execute judgments upon Moab. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Poor Moab. This gets lumped in with the Ammonites. All right. Um, but that's a way of saying they're judged on the same basis of, uh, as Ammon, right? Um, Moab is a brother to Ammon, right? So these are brothers, sons of Lot, right? Uh, of sorts, right? Children. Right, but there is a time, I think I put it in here, where, um, where apparently there's some kind of truce between Israel and Moab because that's where, that's where uh, you know, Naomi lives with Ruth and uh, Orpah, right, her daughter-in-laws, because of the famine in Israel, they go to Moab, and they're allowed to go across the border and live there as expatriates. So there must be some kind of like political truce going on. That's in the book of... It's weird because her sons marry Moabites. And their sons marry Moabites, right? And so Jesus has a Moabite woman in his family tree, Ruth. Which is... There's a lot of uh, scandal in Jesus' family tree. We've talked about that before. Um, there's a lot we can actually talk about with Ammon because it's going to come back in chapter somewhere else. Chapter 35, I think. We're going to talk more about Ammon and Edom as well, if I remember right. What these names mean, by the way? Which ones? Um, Baal, you know that guy. Okay, Bit Yishimot. Uh, house of... Uh, the beginning of that next word is like the beginning of it's not, it's just, it's a proper noun. I mean, that's all it's saying. Beit Jeshemoth. I don't know what these names mean. Go learn some Hebrew. I was trying to pronounce it. All right. Um, so, again, Moab's going to be conquered. Same story. And let's see. We actually um, know a lot about Moab because of the whole narrative in Numbers 22 to 25 with Balak and Balaam. Remember the talking donkey story? Everybody remembers the talking donkey story. Donkey donkey. Donkey donkey. Talking donkey story? No. Yeah. Um, or in my favorite story in the Bible with Eglon and Ehud. Remember Ehud kills Eglon, the king of Moab, by sticking the sword in his belly when he can't find it because his belly's so big. It's gross. Right. Here's the point. I didn't say it in the sermon. I thought about it. You realize if the rich man feasted sumptuously every day, what kind of man was he? So he's got he, uh, plenty of body fat to get him through Hades. <laughs> that would have been a good joke, but no, not appropriate. Yeah, like Java. Yeah. No, that puts a different picture spin on it, right? Clothed in purple and a big fat man sitting there. That's why I picture here. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Corpulent is the word you're looking for. <laughs> All right. Right. So they're going to be given over to the men of the east. That's Babylon, right? Uh, let's see, Balak, Balaam, Eglon, Ehud, the book of Ruth, indicates some kind of truce. We talked about that. David then conquered the land, though, and dealt harshly with it. You know, even though it's his family, in a way, by marriage, right? Eh, whatever. Conquer them, too. Um, Moab joined Ammon and Edom in an unsuccessful attack on Judah. Recorded in Second Chronicles 20. So that's the basis of their judgment. Um, and the prophet Elijah had various skirmishes in Mo- with Moab, too, which we don't talk a lot about Elisha. We like Elijah a lot, but we don't talk about Elisha. So. All right, so they, too, come under Babylon's judgment. Um, note that the, the grammar changed. Now it's Moab is described in the third person. It's not you, but it's just Moab, right? Whereas with Amen, it's because you clapped your hands. You stand second person. Or if you listen to uh, Bam Books' podcast on uh, Friday, we talked about first person. First to second person discourse. Direct discourse is what we call that. Right. So obviously this sounds a lot harsher, right? You, 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 you. Whereas Moab, it's like, ah, but, you know, Moab, you Moab. Or you didn't even say you, Moab. I'll just clear Moab. Now, if you're Moab, you're still like, that's judgment against me. Right? Okay. Well, 
Well, I, I think that that language, they're not um, saying you, like that in the first person. Second it's, person. Uh, excuse me, second person is, <coughs> like, like it says about Moab joined Adam. Yeah, so they're included in that judgment. Right, right, exactly. Well, we know that's true. Second Corinthians twenty or Second Chronicles twenty. <laughs> so those these three they work together against Judah, and that's the reason why they're all included in Amon's judgment. Make sense? All right. Moab correctly discerned Israel's failure to live up to its high calling. I didn't give you a citation for that. Uh, that's not licensed to reject Yahweh and Israel's incomparable claim to the land. All right. Now the Edomites. We like Edom. These are also family members. Named after a stew. Named after this, no. Yes, the yes. stew, that's correct. Stew. It is the stew. What? what? That, that Esau cake. Esau stew. Remember yeah. he had the red stew, the lentils? Mmm. I'm having a lentil nightmare. That's a really deep reference that nobody's going to know. No? Okay. I'm having a lentil nightmare. It's a song. You have to go search for it. It's on the streaming platforms. It's from a television, sh uh, a British, British uh, absurdist comedy program. One of the characters on the program, the actor, ended up doing a, an album. It's called Neil's Heavy Concept Album. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Neil's the character on the show. The show is The Young Ones. Anybody seen The Young? You've seen The Young Ones? You would enjoy The Young Ones. It's totally Gen X. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You'll get the references. Uh, I don't know where you can stream it. I have the DVDs. Thus says the Lord God. Edom. Sorry. Distracted. Anybody? What? What? Okay. Avenging. Lots of avenging. Revenging. Who does vengeance belong to, by the way? Yeah. There's a paragraph on that. It's the second to last paragraph. Throughout the Old Testament, when people or countries are subjects of taking vengeance, this whole word group of avenge, avenge, whatever, implies vindictive excess. So anytime we try to take vengeance, never mind Batman. So God God is the one and Yahweh is the one and only avenger, right? When take her out, please. When Yahweh is the actor, vengeance is with the punitive defeat of the enemies of the people, that which ensures his people's protection and salvation. So, God is the only one who can exercise vengeance for the benefit of the people, right? Because only He can judge. Never mind Solomon. He did a pretty good job, right? He had that wisdom of discernment, but uh, we don't, right? This is why I don't wade into arguments about whether we should be at war with any. I'm typically just like, don't bother with any of it, but non-aggression non principle. But like, I'm not going to fly your pro-Ukrainian flag because I figure Ukraine's just as guilty as Russia, right? God only knows, actually, is the right expression. And there is no fault. And obviously our involvement in it is even worse. It's, anyway, I'll leave. I do have opinions. <laughs> All right. Um, by the way, Edom, Ethan brought this up, but Edom is really next to Babylon, the, the, the sign of like the sinful world, you know, the type of that. How do I say it? Symbol and type of all the kingdoms of the world, of Satan's realm. Uh, with unending conflict. Why? It's set up with the story of Edom, also known as Esau, Jacob and Esau, or Hatfields and McCoys, or whatever, right? But it's that, it's that age-old story of the two brothers that are at war with each other. 
right? Now, by the, obviously, it's weird because Esau ends up reconciling with Jacob. And we, we miss that part of the story, right? And yet, the land of Edom doesn't reconcile and doesn't live at peace <laughs> with their... Those two do, but their children. Their children don't. That's correct. Yeah. Um, by the way, Babylon, they're also family. What? Where did God call Abraham from? Ur of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans, is the, that's a, it's a region of Babylon, also the ruling families of Babylon are the Chaldeans. So Abraham came from Babylon. Isaac's wife came from Babylon. Yeah, it wasn't called Babylon then, it was called Chaldea. But. So they're all related. So why are they, hurting, why are they killing each other? Brothers at war with brothers. I feel like I've heard songs about this. There's probably 60s folk songs about brothers fighting each other, right? I'm not a big fan of the whole brotherhood of man thing, but, but that, it's actually true. They have, we all have common ancestry. That yeah. Might put a different view on uh, when Jesus said, like, um, like people in the family will fight each other. Yeah, mother against daughter, hus- father against sons, husband against wife. He's talking about the history of God's people, actually. He's talking about Israel. That's great. That's a great exegesis there. It's already happened. And Jesus is the one who brings the conflict. And if there's no conflict, it might, not, it might be that you actually believe the same thing, or it might be that Jesus has not been preached. <laughs> Could be one of the two. All right. Uh, Let's see, the hatred of Israel and Edom seems especially bitter. Few feuds and grudges are as sharp as those between siblings. In this case, Jacob and Esau. Right, because you're betraying your own blood. Your own one flesh. I mean, you come from the same flesh. So it's like denying yourself. That's why it's so bitter. Does that make sense? You don't think of your siblings that way? They're like, you're the same. You came from the same place. So if you hate your brother, you're hating yourself. <laughs> oh, we do hate ourselves. Okay. Well, oh, well, fair enough. No, we love ourselves. That's what sin is. <laughs> no, I understand what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. We hate who God has given us to be, who he's given us as our family, as our neighbors. Yeah. Because it's hatred of God then. Yeah. 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 Uh, Genesis 32, 33 indicates that Esau had settled Edom before Jacob's return from Haran. Remember when he had to run away? Uh, Before Saul's coronation, Edom had already had eight kings. So when Israel says, we want a king like the nations around us, what do they mean? Like our cousin, Edom. Okay. Look at how well it's going for them. Uh, Moses tries, appeals in vain to to traverse their territory in Numbers 20 to go through it. The Edomites won't let him through. We have no written Edomite records that have survived. Apparently they weren't big into writing or everything got destroyed or both, right? Whereas we have a lot from like the Philistines. Anyway, Um, so we depend on the Old Testament accounts. David massacred many Edomites, 2 Samuel 8. Solomon gave them some independence, 1 Kings 11. And here it is, Edom's betrayal after the Zedekiah incident, which we've talked about, but maybe you don't remember. Zedekiah was the puppet king set up by Babylon, who then conspired with Egypt against Babylon. Okay, right. Um, Is the cause for the outrage expressed in Obadiah 11 through 14, Psalm 137, Lamentations 4, that's by Jeremiah. And then Edomites will later settle in Judah, taking on the name, the Edomians, of whom... Herod the Great is an Idumean. Yeah, so there you go. Right, so when Herod, um, I mean, he's, he's a distant relative of the Jews of Judah, right? By way of Judah's uncle. <laughs> you have to go back a long way, right? But then Herod, that's why Herod can have some claim for the th- throne because likely, I don't, I don't know if we have any of this, but it seems like he made an appeal to Rome on the basis that he, that he had some ancestral claim to be a, a governor there. And that's why he rebuilds the temple. 
but they all treat him like he's a half breed because he's more than that. Yeah. Uh, well, half breed and incestuous too. So figure that one out. You're not well bred. We'll put it that way. All right. Yes, the full judgment against Edom will come in Ezekiel 35. So even though we only have a few verses here, you know, they are as significant um, a type or shadow of the world as Babylon is in, say, Revelation. But Edom will get a whole chapter, basically, in, in Ezekiel 35. So they get lumped in here because of the way they collaborated with Ammon and Moab. So all this makes perfect sense, right? When you're, as long as you get a little history, a little background, you're like, oh, I see. God's judging them for conspiring against him and they're against his nation. Make sense? Yeah. Oh, but we might as well mention the Philistines. Why not? Oh, you have an interesting what? point here. I have an interesting in point. That, in Good. That in that paragraph, uh, second paragraph under Edom, Yahweh's judgment is depopulation and desecration. Depopulation and de- desecration. Well, yeah, because that sounds familiar, doesn't it? That, that makes one thing. That all those people who are conspiring to depopulate our country or the entire world are actually agents of Yahweh's wrath. They could be agents of Yahweh's wrath, or they could be mimicking Yahweh in a satanic way. Yeah. It's not your job to give life or to take life. It isn't. That belongs to God alone. Right? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Right? And also deciding like how much rain you get. I know some of you have been doing your na- naked pagan rain des- dances, trying to get it to rain. But... Um, oh. I don't know why I mentioned the naked part. Clouds here. There weren't any clouds. There was no humidity. There was nothing to seed. Yeah. All right, so then we're going to throw in the Philistines for good measure, even though they've been gone for a while, actually, at this point. <laughs> Thus says the Lord God, because the Philistines acted revengefully and took vengeance with malice of soul to destroy a never-ending enmity. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will stretch out my hand against the Philistines, and I will cut off the Carathites and destroy the rest of the sea coast. I will execute great vengeance on them with wrathful rebukes. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I lay my vengeance upon them. All right, so some more vengeance. Uh, the Philistines are like the ancient enemy, though, the old enemy. They've already been defeated. Uh, let's see. First, David defeated Achish, the king of Gath, in 1 Samuel 27, and then finally wipes them all out pretty much in 2 Samuel 5. Um, but there are s- some cultural clashes recorded later, 1 Kings 15 and 16. Um, what seems like is that Phil- the Philistines as a nation ended with David, but the cities still have, they still call themselves Philistines, they still have kings, but it's like city-states, Right. And really, the only one that we know too much about, I mentioned in the sermon, actually, Ashkelon. Ashkelon. Um, was leveled by Nebuchadnezzar and has been confirmed by uh, excavation. So they've excavated all of Ashkelon, which is why you can find out about their healing center with the 1,500 dog graves. Because they found it. Right. Wait, they, wait, huh? It was in the sermon. Weren't you paying attention? Yeah. I was... You were not. <laughs> you were not paying attention. I heard. Well, I hear. Yeah, the licking, licking the sores. Yeah, yeah they had, the, they had, a, they had like a healing center in Ashkelon where you could go, where they were trained instead of wild dogs. Most of them are. Yeah, to come lick your sores, and pay them some cash. Yeah, it, I don't know. It's not any more gross than like leeches, which it probably actually works better than leeches. Well, they came from Phoenicia. They were probably head and shoulder above Israel. Probably, you know. So, so would like the, the measurement of like nine feet of the Goliath? I think it's wrong. Accurate? I think it's wrong. Yeah. There's different ways to count the, the height of Goliath, but um, a typical Israelite probably about that time is 5'7", male. So if you went up against a 6'4 guy and you're 5'7", so or 7' foot guy. All the Phoenicians were... They were like giants. They were yeah, they were like going up against the, the Milwaukee Bucks, and you're this little guy. Let's play basketball. No. No, you're going to be defeated. Exactly. Never mind skill. All right. Um, in exasperation after the second Jewish revolt, this is in Josephus, in AD 135, 
This is interesting for you culturally. The Romans renamed the province Palestine after Judah's archetypal enemy. So why was it called Palestine? Philistine, Palestine, same word. They called it Palestine to mock the Jews, who they had defeated, and who kept revolting. They kept fighting back, and they don't fight, really fight back. Um, so, you know, Roger Waters is right when he says that, that the Palestinians have a claim on that land, because they've been there for, what year are we in, 2000? So they had been there for 1,700 years, set up by the Romans. And then to come in and say, no, we, that land belongs to a people before you, I mean, yeah, never-ending so, sorts of problems now by doing that. Carving up land and giving it to someone else just doesn't work. Even for when you're trying to be like, we're going to be so kind here, Indians, we're going to run you off your land, but we're going to give you Oklahoma. Oh. <laughs> All right, so yeah, Palestine, when you hear Palestine, that's why the Palestinians... And the Jews are at war because they're ancient enemies. They think of themselves because of the word. I mean, it doesn't even matter if it's true. How many Palestinians marry Jews over the century? Centuries, right? The millennia. <laughs> it doesn't even matter. Your Philistines were Jews. So let's fight. It's fun. It's kind of like the Missouri Synod. What? When you, when you found an institution based on conflict, the conflict is the basis of your reason for existing, right? So Missouri Synod was founded on the basis of what we're not. <laughs> and so that's who we're always fighting against, who we're not. You know, we're not the Union Church, we're not Reformed, and we're not Roman Catholics, because that's the Reformation, right? But that's not how you want to identify yourself, by who you're not. That's fine, but who are you? <laughs> you know, do the positive. The saying who you're not does not define who you are. No, yeah. It's, it's called theology by negation. It doesn't go anywhere helpful. They're like, well, we don't, we don't sell indulgences. Okay, fine, what do you do? <laughs> like, let's, okay, fine, you're not Roman Catholic. Now tell me who you are. Can you do it? Yeah, this is why you learn the confessions. At least learn the small catechism if you could. Right? Then you can say, I believe this and this and this. And you're like, well, that's not different than me. Like, oh, okay. Well, then maybe we do it. Are there other things that we don't? Okay. But... You'll find that you actually have more in common with most Christians than you don't. But when you do it by negation, you always think, ah, oh, we're greater than you, we're better than you, right? And it sets you in place of boasting or pride above the people who you're not. Okay. Yeah, and then that makes you unneedfully surprised when people from other uh, denominations... Well, you saw that Pat... Oh, that person seemed very Lutheran. You saw that Pat Robertson became a Lutheran, right? Because he died and went to heaven? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a jo it's a stupid joke. It's like when people die and they go to heaven, they find out that they were Lutheran the whole time. <laughs> There's the other joke is that, um, that the other churches tell, is that when they come to the room with the Lutherans, and the Lutherans are surprised anybody else is there. Oh. I don't remember how the joke goes, but uh, yeah. But I'm not, I'm not super ecumenical, but like, do you confess the creed? Do you confess the prayer? Do you confess... What the Bible teaches about baptism and Lord's Supper. Okay, we have a lot more in common if, we're, if you're there, right? Now, whether you baptize infants, okay, all right, uh, we got to talk about that. And, you know, do you believe in, yeah. At that point, in that point is, it, is it even heterodoxical? Yeah, it's heterodoxical. That's what it is. Yep. What all right. If you don't, what, if, real quick, what if you don't talk to your friends about Philistines hmm. that are Christian, mm -hmm. but they're not, like, like not baptizing infants? And mm -hmm. they say it, and what if you don't? Yeah, because. Yeah, the rapture, I wouldn't lump in with baptism. Yeah, the rapture, I wouldn't lump in with baptism. I think they're qualitatively of a different sort. Oh, okay. um, because well, the, they, they cause the rapture is an is a errant doctrine pulled out of a text that doesn't teach doctrine, which is Revelation. That's different. Whereas denying baptism to infants actually requires you, by implication, to go against Jesus' word. Yeah. And explicitly to go against the testimony of the apostles in the book of Acts, where they're baptizing young children. And you could even, by extension, use Jesus' own word on that. So I think it's of a different sort. It's a different kind of rejection. Um, but I, would, I wouldn't say they're outside of Christian faith, but I would say you are, you are withholding a gift from children that God wants to give them. 
It's kind of like um, God preserved the faith of Moses, even though he and his sons weren't circumcised. Like they had forgotten about circumcision in Egypt, apparently. It's like that's the sign of the covenant. And they didn't do it. And Zipporah does it to the, the kids. His Midianite wife, uh, Midianite priest, priest wife, priest's daughter's wife, whatever. So technically she probably, but she's like, no, God promised. And he attached it to the sign. Why haven't you done it? And she throws, she throws the foreskin at his feet. <laughs> what a story. Zipporah figures out that God, God wants to kill him because he hasn't done it. This is only like three verses. It's this weird little story, but it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Zipporah is like, God's angry with you because you haven't, you're not living according to the covenant. You're not living by the promise. So I'll do it. Well, when you think about, like, I have a friend who her daughter wasn't going to baptize the baby. She mm. secretly baptized Yeah, that's, uh, that's awkward on, one, on the one hand. Um, is it according to the institution that the Lord gives? Does the institution require parent, parental consent, for example, of baptism? Is it wise to baptize without parental consent? That's the question. Do the parents have a role in baptism? I'm asking questions, but you, I'm saying it's not an easy question. <laughs> That's why I'm answering it with questions. Yeah. Um, I heard a story about a friend of mine, or not friend, it was a, somebody just came and spoke to at the seminary. Um, and he was doing ministry to the Hmong in, in Fort Wayne, which we have quite a few in Sheboygan as well, right? Um, and he, would, he required, even if it was just mom and the kids that were being baptized, he required the fathers to come and at least stand there and consent to it, even if he didn't believe. Because he wasn't about to drive the family apart over something like baptism. And uh, a lot of people, in the, when they heard the presentation, disagreed with him. And I think there's room for disagreement on that. Right? But the, 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 the problem is, is that what we want, and what the, what the Bible teaches, is we want you to trust in your baptism. But that requires you to know about it. And I've had people come and they don't remember if they were, they don't even know if they were baptized. They think they were. It's like... It's, you know, that, and that's how the situation happens. His grandma did it in the bathtub or something. Yeah. Um, so we want you to have confidence and assurance and to be able to take comfort in your baptism and to live daily in your baptism, which then requires, I would suggest, witnesses at least. You know what I mean? The testimony of two or three. Um, even better, the testimony of the church, of a congregation. So that's why we keep baptismal records. So that if somebody calls up and like, I'm not sure, like you were on this date by this pastor, you know, at this font, and, and you can you can rest confident and assured in that. Yeah, it's it's always been eyewitness testimony, including your baptism. Yeah. So that's the problem with secret baptisms. Um, I had a lady in my first parish who had done a grandmother had done it to a grandchild um, because the parents were dumb, even though they were Christians, they just didn't. And the kid was uh, potentially going to die, right? This is a neonatal kind of thing. And, um, but then at, the child lived, and so then they, um, she didn't tell the parents, but she, had, she brought him to baptism in the church. Now, which baptism counted? It doesn't matter, right? But for the sake of confidence and assurance, she told me that she had done it, and then later the pastor did it, and everybody witnessed that. It's not two baptisms, there's only one baptism, but for confidence and assurance, you, you bring them to church. And there's a, we actually have a right for this, to present someone who's been baptized before. Well, that's like um, Kyle, mm-hmm. the first one, um, yes, baptized them. You know, so like the mm-hmm. Right. But then we brought them to church for a Public yeah. recognition, yeah. yeah, public recognition. Yeah, and that's a little bit different. The pastor baptized, he was there, he can testify. There were other witnesses, mm-hmm. right? Um, this is also why typically you want the pastor to do it. As again, I just got air blowing on me. Um, so that uh, it's just another level of, you know, assurance, I guess, that it was done according to the, right, the regular right of the church. Yeah. Even if it was done in the hospital. I don't know why people withhold baptism from their children. We've, we had that recently here. Bug me. It was like, we can baptize at home and then do the public recognition. Or we, you know. Like what? You can't get all the sponsors here. The sponsors can come later. I, 
I don't know. There yeah. were some kids back when I think everything's nobody else. We were the, the couple that settled the boys and it came for confirmation time. Pastor was not going to confirm them until they were baptized. Yeah, right. Yep. Yeah, there's no admission to the Lord's table without baptism. That's the unanimous consent of the church. You don't go to the table without being baptized. Because it's a, meal, it's a family meal, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. So you wouldn't confirm until they were baptized, because confirmation typically was admission to the table. Right, exactly. Yeah, hard questions there. But it's a lot of family stuff, right? Huh. Why do, how did we get to on that point? I don't even know. Ethan brought it up. <laughs> I don't remember what brought it up. Yeah, it's all good. Okay, so that's it. Uh, the judgment of the Ammonites. And now we get to do tire. Lots of tire judgment. Yeah. And then there's even a lament for tire after that. So tire is an interesting case. So we'll talk quite a bit about that. Plus it has a date. So we actually know when it is. Okay, you can depart. Yeah. Come for the uh, open house later.